a suit and tie and get your hair cut way up high. Get yourself a lawyer, son. You're gonna need a real good one. Here's a question for you. Just how bored do you think David Whiting is in lockdown? He's a man about town. He's a very, very busy lawyer. He's been doing this job for 125 years. Just how bored do you think he might be when he submits to me a memo, subject of which homework lots, runs to one, two, three pages, three solid single-spaced pages of material that he'd like to go through with me. David Whiting, good morning. How bored are you? I'm not bored at all, Virginia, but it seems to me that you'd had two weeks. I was trying to get you up to speed oh, yes. uh, before we, oh, it's before all for the, me, before we started. It? Absolutely. <laughs> but last week we had a series of fantastic questions in relation to holidays. Yes. And when we cancel and what the consequences are. And I also got a whole series of emails on the same topic during the week. hmm So Roger from Red Hill was where it started and the question arises is, well, when am I entitled to a refund and when can I have, or when do I have to put up with a credit? What's the deal? So we started with a cruise company and the question arises as to if you cancel a cruise, the general proposition is, is, is that you lose your fee. Right. So, and... And what was the impact of the Prime Minister's statement on the 15th of March that says no cruise ships um, come Monday? Yeah. And that, that was where it started. So we had a whole lot of very concerned people who were looking at trying to cancel their holidays prior to the 16th of March. So, and, and what have you discovered for them? Well, for them... You have to look at the contract that you signed and if the contract is with a cruise company that says you cancel 14 days out, you lose everything, well, that's what your rights are. Now, some of them have been offering uh, credit deals and some have not, but if you bailed out yeah. under the contract that you signed, the general proposition is that you can't have anything. And, and pandemics and states of emergency don't make any difference there? Well, there's a contract. You've chosen to cancel because of your perception. So if you're on the 10th of March, you decide to cancel your cruise for the 25th of March, then the cancellation provisions in your contract come into play and your contract comes to an end because of the agreement that you signed. Now, if you then get to the 17th of March and you say it's now not possible for the cruise to take place then what you have is the benefit of the frustration provisions in the Consumer Law and Fair Trading Act, which essentially says that if the contract is incapable of being performed, then we try and put everybody back in the position we were. You don't have to perform anymore and you get your money back. Mm. But the people who cancelled on the 13th of March, their contract came to an end then. Yeah. So is it tough? Absolutely. Uh, next call. So, but but that's the, when did we do it? And of course, if you then start to get even more complicated, and you say, well, I've now booked a hotel in Switzerland. Uh, was it was it on close down at the time that I I decided I didn't want to travel anymore? So, if you're a private, if you've organised all of these things, you might have seven or eight different contracts, all mm. of which have slightly different issues. And, and then we had Bob from... Yep. No, go on, go on. So then we had Bob from Strathmore, and Bob had booked a... a was going to a an event in San Francisco. Uh, the event was cancelled. Qantas cancelled the flight as well. He got a refund for one, and all he's got on the other for the offer is a credit. But if you look at Qantas's terms of control, terms say, if we make a significant change to your flight due to an event beyond our control, we will... If we're unable to rebook or you want a service acceptable to you, we will refund the fare. So from that one, that was a good one. That's a good one. And 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 Airbnb and Stays, who are the main, I suppose, arrangers for end-to-end travel, they've got a set of rules in place, but it's effectively you've signed a contract or you've entered into a contract with the accommodation provider at the other end and every contract's different. 
Anything to observe about people who might hold tickets or forward bookings with Virgin now that it's gone into administration? Uh, yeah. Um, the answer would be that there's, there's two issues there. Um, the first is that we don't actually know what's going to happen to Virgin. We all have a, a view that it's not going to be good, but yeah. they, they may survive in some form. Um, Virgin's approach, which I looked at before yesterday, was that um, we're going to do our absolute darndest to get you where you need to go, so don't come looking. Um, there are two... It, it, the, the, what you need to do is look at the chargeback provisions that apply to your credit card. So, and most of the credit card companies or the banks have a process that says you can dispute a transaction within 30 days of the statement yep. that contained the transaction. So you, you, got, you do it that way through your credit card? Yes. Yep. Well, okay. just make it really easy, just you're not going to be flying. Uh, and that, that chargeback should also apply if the, even if the airline survives, if they're not running the service you paid for. All right, let's get to some calls. Our number is 1300 222 774. David Whiting is here to dispense some free legal advice. Joe's in South Morang. Hello. Hello, peoples. How are you? Good. Um, my youngest son works at a fast food restaurant, and being that he's only an L plater, we usually have to take him to work ourselves. But under the lockdown rules, if he say, drives under our supervision as an L-plater, can that be done? Joe, I'm, these are difficult times. I, I don't want to encourage people to say, yes, I understand the rules and I think they're great, but they don't apply to me in these circumstances. Well, I, think that taking an, I think that taking an L-plater to work constitutes travel for work purposes, all right? So that you, the, if you like, the, the fact that there are L plates front and back are incidental to the trip. So I say that's okay, but I think you, you're skating fairly close to the edge. So in other words, if you, um, there's a chance that if, if we did um, let him drive to work and, and he was pulled over, there's a chance that some policeman might say, well, here's, here's either a warning or a ticket, and then the ticket we well, might have to appeal. Well, that's the argument that you have, but on my reading of the stay-at-home directions, driving to work is OK. But what if it's done by an L-plater driving to work? Well, they're still, the L-plater's still driving to work. Oh, OK. But, All not, right, but, so not, but not on their own. Right. They still need someone supervising yeah. them. Oh, absolutely. We, and we take the car home, obviously. Well, that's still part of the work trip. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Don't have a problem. So, um, so if a couple, if a couple a pulls you over, problem, Joe, just just the refer them to David Whiting. Technical legal is okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Blame me. <laughs> All right. Thank he you. will. Good on you. Thank Thanks, you. Joe. Good to hear from you. Dave's called in from Gippsland. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, last year, I spoke to yourself and uh, and John Fain about a matter with a car that caught fire, which was under warranty, and I yes. took your advice and uh, lodged an application with VCAT. I checked in February and March after the application was granted and they hadn't set a date. Last Thursday I received an email saying because I'd failed to turn up on the 14th of March, the matter was dismissed and the respondent didn't turn up either. I spoke to the respondent and neither they nor myself were advised of a date, so I eventually got onto VCAT and they said on the 14th of March anything that didn't have a, in the civil list, uh, didn't have a, a court date was dismissed. Because it was an order of VCAT, I had two choices, to go to the Supreme Court and appeal the decision or to go back to VCAT and relist it. And there's 2,200 uh, cases... I would be applying for a relisting. They said I can't do that because it was a, a, uh, a decision of VCAT. I had to apply to have it considered for relisting and there's 2,200 cases the same, all struck out on the same day, which was the date that... Victoria went into lockdown the 14th of March. Well, so you can apply for a relisting. Yep. Then Start apply for a relisting and you'll be like the other 2,200 in the queue. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Thanks for much, indeed.
Sorry, Dave. Good luck. It's a yeah, tough situation to be in. Yep. Good, good luck to you. Bernie's calling from Lang Warren. Hello. Yes, good morning to you both. In my will, I have two powers of attorney. Um, two executives. What I want to do, it says, in my will, for my shares to be sold. Now, I want to make that at the discretion of my attorneys. That's one. And the second one is two grandchildren to inherit a sum of money at 21. I want that changed to 18. Can I do that with a, a letter signed by my uh, attorneys or not? Uh, when you say attorneys, you mean executors, I think, Bernie. Uh, well, they are family members who are my attorneys, yes, but they, financial and medical. So they're, they're your attorneys today, but when you die, they'll be your executors. Is that right? Yes. Certainly. Maybe yeah, they're yes. named in your will to give effect to your will? Yes. All right. Now, the uh, there remains a discretion in executors to not sell. So the, the normal will reads something like this, I appoint X to be my executor. Everything goes to my executor to turn it into cash and to distribute it like this. You can include a specific provision that says you don't want them sold. There's also a general discretion in executors with the consent of the beneficiaries to delay and, in fact, to distribute in specie. But I, my preference would be that you would either do it with a, with a codicil or that you would redo your will. Now, you can get a codicil. There's a template for a codicil in the lawhandbook.net.au so you can have a look at one and it's really just the way it's signed so this is bernie's codicil first codicil to his will dated x and and i now don't want my shares to be sold but to distribute it to the beneficiaries and in clause 27 i gave money to my grandchildren at age 21 i now want it at age 18 and if you sign it in accordance with the directions you find there you'll be fine so you sign it in the presence of two witnesses who sign in, si in the sight and presence of each other. Yeah, but Does that help? Well, what I want is my shares to be sold at a time of their discretion. Yes, they have that discretion under the will anyway. Because, I mean, you wouldn't want to sell them at the moment, would you? No. So I can do that with a codicil or yes, a letter? Yes, you can. No, you can't do it with a letter. Uh, uh, there is a requirement of a degree of formality in relation to a change of a will. So you've got to say it's a codicil, you've got to say what it's a codicil to, you recite the changes that you want made, you need to then sign it as a codicil, and you need two witnesses who sign in the sight and presence of each other. Can so they be my attorneys? Uh, yes, they can. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Bernie. Good luck. Good to talk to you this morning. It sounds straightforward. A lot of people have not only have one codicil, as I understand, David, but, but a number of them attached to a will. Do, does that, is that possible? Is that legal? And does it get very complicated? Well, a codicil is uh, um, you know, a small change. Yeah. And uh, now that most wills live on word processes for years, changing the, the basic document is the easiest way to do it. It is. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jenny's called in from McKinnon. Hello. Hi, Virginia. Hi, David. Hello. I'm an, I'm an owner of uh, a unit that's in a block of 10 units. There's uh, four units run down each side of the property and there's two units across the bottom. Units were built about 1969. Um, there are also stormwater pipes which run um, at the back of all the units. Now, the unit, um, the two units down at the bottom of the property, let's just call it one and two, at the back of number one, there's a, another property and that um, owner is complaining of flooding on their property and um, the stormwater pipes, um, she's got a, an easement running right down to the street and uh, there's also the stormwater pipe runs from the units right down to the street and there are 15 or 16 very large trees which have been grown along the entire easement and uh, that person is saying that, we're, that um, she's had advice from the council and the council has said that it's a private stormwater drain and it's the responsibility of the unit owners to pay for the um, rectification. 
Jenny, my view is that the stormwater pipes that that uh, the stormwater drainage system that operates for the units uh, is a is an owners corporation problem. Ah, uh, okay. Why right, is that? So, why? Because it doesn't just service the units one and two, or unit one or unit two. It services the units upstream as well, does it not? Yes, yes, that's correct. So, so it's a shared resource. But uh, what about the neighbour at the, at the back? So that's uh, a, a se completely separate property, not part of the unit. So where is the water coming from? Is it coming uh, from the units or from the neighbour? I think it's coming from the, from the units through the stormwater pipes and then running then it's, right uh, down. Then, it, then it's an owner's corporation issue in that their, uh, their stormwater system isn't working the way it was intended. Even though that stormwater pipe is on um, that, na uh, that neighbour's property? Okay, so so it's already so it's it's not within the block of units. It's yeah. left the units and into the easement at the neighbour's point at the end. Yes, that's right. And then it runs along the entire length of her property as well. Uh, I'm going to take that one on notice, Jenny. I'll think about it. Um, I, I don't see it. Might be the water company's issue, but I, I don't think so. No, so the, the problem will the problem will be well, who owns the trees? The neighbour. Well, then it's the neighbour. If you think logically, it's the neighbour's trees which are almost inevitably blocking the stormwater. Right. How, how do you how do you go go about um, cheaply investigating all that, David? Uh, you would put down a. You'd normally get a plumber to put down a camera. Yep. And the camera would tell you, and if its tree roots are blocking the easement, the the. Whoever owned the property years before the neighbour at the back granted an easement over the back of the property to enable it to be used for drainage purposes. Yep. The owner of the property can do what they like provided that it doesn't interfere with the drainage rights. And what you will find is that the trees have Interfered. almost inevitably broken the pipe yep. and are accessing the water and uh, it's flooding from time to time. And who, who would be responsible to pay for the services of the plumber? Ultimately, it would be the person who owns the trees. Okay, so oh. you'd end up charging them once you got the plumber well, to establish that? Well, uh, uh, the, the, if, if I owned the block of units, I'd, I'd be saying to the person over the back, I want you to prove that it's my fault. Yep. Because they yep. won't be able to do anything without proving that it's your fault. Okay. Does that help? Yes, that's, Good on that's you, Jenny. very helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. Good luck. Hope it goes okay. Yeah. Interestingly, David, we've got another question on stormwater pipes. This is from Brian in Bayswater. Hi, Brian. Hello. I'm the blooming neighbour. Oh, you're <laughs> the neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, the one, you're the one bucking up the pipes, are you? <laughs> I'm the neighbour, though. Um, so she's number 10 and we're number 12. Right? And it's a block of 11 apartments. I own the bottom apartment, which has a garden, obviously. Hang on, hang and on. Just, just, just pause one second. You're, you're, in, you're in totally different suburbs, so you're not talking about the same story, are you? I think we are. No, well, well we've got she very... She was a neighbour over the back fence, Brian. But we've got, we've got very different suburbs mentioned here, so maybe they're not the right... Maybe they were yep. false anyway, suburbs. I don't, anyway, go on. Okay. Uh, I don't know if David <laughs> remember. I, I ran last week to say my backyard stays flooded right and uh, he said look the best just put in the owner or channel to take the water but it was discovered the last few months that the storm water coming from number 10 orchard road runs on the boundary of my property and it's blocked and damaged so we got lily, lily pillies um so the question is is number 10 responsible for that uh, old pipe because the units is most probably 40 years old, 40, 50 years old. The two questions who's responsible to repair that pipe? Our body corp or their body corp? Uh, Bill, I, I suppose the if the who broke the pipe? No one knows, no one knows. Well, so then the answer is I can't give you the I can't give you the answer to the question because if it was your trees or your plantings that that 
uh, force the, that broke the pipe, then fixing the pipe is your problem. And when you say my, you mean the body corporate's problem? Your body corporate's problem, yes. Uh, so question, someone, it, said, hmm? someone said just block it in and they'll make quite sure they have to get to another a water run. But I said, no, I won't do that. Uh, now, Brian, the issue is there is uh, who's... So the water leaves their property into an easement across the back of your property. Correct, yeah. Uh, so, and there's a blockage. The question is, what? where's the blockage? What caused the blockage? And that will tell you who's responsible for fixing the blockage. Yeah, we, we had a plumber with his camera and he pointed two spots. The one spot where he actually uh, highlighted it, there's no tree there. There's no little lily-pilly tree. Well, the, the, either the pipe mysterious. through your property belongs to the water authority or belongs to your neighbour. I think yeah. at the end of the day it will belong to the water authority and the question then becomes is, well, who has to fix it? And my question will be, well, who broke it? Yeah. And if that can't I, be... I water, Melbourne, Melbourne Water. They said, no, it's not their problem. Well, it wouldn't I be Melbourne the... Water. It might I be uh, the... uh, Yarra Valley or City West Water or... or one of those yeah so i'm going back to my because we in this unit for nearly two years now july will be two years and i got photos that garden was always the back garden was always flooded so the, the question and, uh, here the challenge here david is going to be proving who or what did it that's where this yes, whole thing falls. that's your starting point yeah who caused the problem okay and if, a right. and if a plumber can't establish that, then is that the end of the matter, David? I guess you could try well, and equitably come to some continue. arrangement. Well, the flood will You try and do a deal. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because it will benefit everybody if the problem goes away. All right. Well, um, good luck with that one. They can't be the same neighbours. I've got two totally different suburbs here. Unless maybe, David, people are using um, not nom de plume, but uh, suburb de plume, perhaps? Oh, well, one of them might have been an investment property. You just don't ah, know. But that's, yeah, I'm, that's very true. Yeah, yes. Um, Mark has called in from Ashburton. Mark, good morning. Good morning, uh, Virginia and David. Thanks for taking my call. No worries. Um, my car was written off in January due to the hail storm that we had. Mm -hmm. And yes. a very well-known insurance company have told me that I only have two days in which to give them my car. And, of course, with the virus that's happening, I can't buy another car because car yards are closed and you can't test drive. Okay. And I I've thought car appealed. yards were still open. They're open, but you can't test drive. You're not oh. allowing anybody to test drive a car. Oh, because that's not essential travel, I suppose. That, that's right, yeah. Uh -huh. And I don't really want to put myself or my wife at risk of going and trying to get into a car that, uh, you know, it's, it's against, it's not an essential service. Yep. And I've asked for consideration from the insurance company and they're basically fobbing me off. And I'm just wondering what my rights are in relation to that. They're found within your insurance contract, Mark. I suppose the question would be, would you be prepared to accept a diminution in value? So the, the, the insurance company has sold your car. They just have to deliver it. Right. So they've got an agreement with you that this, this, this is the process. You might have an agreed value policy, so they're going to pay yep. you 10 grand. That's and they've right. taken pictures of your vehicle and they've found someone who's going to buy it in its current state and they're yep. going to give them X dollars. Yes. Now, the question is, is that if you keep driving the car, is it going to drop in value? Right. Because they're no longer able to on-sell it. Right. I've just asked them for a couple of months' consideration during this period, and hopefully I will be able to look for another car, because I'm, right. I can't buy and another one. <laughs> no, no, I understand. Well, you can, but yeah. you want to test drive it, that, right? That's right, yeah. So, yeah. so, so where you're at is that you've come along and said, look, I, I, what I want to do is I want to fix my value today. I'm just yep. not ready to take it. Yes. Who is going to bear the risk of a drop in value of the vehicle in the meantime? Right, I understand. So that's where I would start the discussion. So you don't... You, so that, that would be... If I was acting for the insurance company, that would be my issue. Mm -hmm. I've already right. agreed to sell it to a wrecker for X dollars. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I see. Okay, good luck. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for your help. Thanks so much. You've got a little bit of home. Oh, one question to take away there on notice, yep. David. Only one. Yep. Which means I should expect a shorter memo next week, correct? I'm not even going to send you one. <laughs> Lovely to talk to you again. Take care. Thanks, Virginia. David Whiting there, your talk back lawyer.